through 10. Now read it and you'll hear it. I will love thee, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength, whom I trust, my buckler and the horn of my salvation and my high tower. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from my enemies. The sorrows of death compassed me, and the floods of ungodly men made me afraid. The sorrows of hell compassed me about. The snares of death prevented me. In my distress I called upon the Lord and cried unto my God. He heard my voice out of his temple, and my cry came before him, even into his ears. Amen. Then the earth shook and trembled. The foundations also of the hills moved and were shaken because he was wroth. There went up a smoke out of his nostrils and fire out of his mouth. Devoured coals were kindled by it. He bowed the heavens also and came down and darkness was under his feet. And he rode upon a cherub and did fly. Yea, he did fly upon the wings mm -hmm. of the wind. May the Lord add a rich blessing to the reading and hearing of his word. Amen. to just recite with me as we read from the 23rd Psalm again. Ask all those who can to stand with me as we read and recite together this 23rd Psalm. Can you put it up, Rudy? Next one. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil. Come on, say amen. 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 Is all right here. Amen. Amen. Thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, Amen. they comfort me. Amen. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You may be seated, beloved. As a way of introduction to those who are not here the last time I spoke, and as a review for others, we began a journey into and through what is arguably the greatest psalm in all the Psalter, the most known passage of Scripture in all the Bible, and one of the most popular poems in the whole world, these words penned in Psalms 23. This psalm has been used to comfort the hearts of millions throughout the ages as they face difficult dilemmas, and it is both beloved and beholden by people inside and outside the church. There's really no need, next slide really, there really is no need to try to guess as to why this psalm is so popular. One need only hear its poetic beauty. 
see its powerful imagery and be embraced by its profound assurances to understand why so many people love the 23rd Psalm. The 23rd Psalm presents itself in this opening section of verses 1 to 3, which we exegetically examined in part 1, and noted how the psalmist David shares with us the profession of relationship, the privilege of restoration, and the protection of reverence. Today, as we journey into part two of this three-part message, I want to beg your patience and your prayers as we labor in love over just one verse this afternoon. I want to invite you to the heart of this psalm, words are embraced by millions. This fourth verse of Psalm 23. Rudy? Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Come on, say amen. Amen. As we begin our examination Amen. of this fourth verse, allow me to tell you that what's most notable about verse four is the same thing that's most disturbing about verse four. For one will recall in verses one to three that the psalmist is speaking about green pastures. The psalmist is testifying about still waters. The psalmist is describing the paths of righteousness. And now, beloved, without any indication of when, how, or why, the scenery shifts. The context is changed. No longer is the psalmist talking about pleasant places. But all of a sudden, the psalmist begins to testify about the valley of the shadow of death. No indication of how, when, or why this change occurred, but we have transition from verse 3 with the still waters and green pastures, and now we find ourselves in the midst of the valley of the shadow of death. And I want to suggest to you that the very structure of this psalm is meant to clue you into the fact that just because the Lord is your shepherd does not mean you cannot or will not every now and again Hmm. Find yourself in the valley of the shadow of death. Amen. Somebody, you need to write that down because you are under the naive misconception that when you gave your life to Christ and started putting money in the offering plate, uh, brought the biggest Bible in store, started quoting scriptures from Genesis to Revelation, wearing a cross around your neck, going to church Sabbath That's after true. Sabbath. You thought, beloved, because of that, that somehow by you doing that, that will shelter you from the storms of life that you would have immunity from the valley, that you would not have to go through shadowy places, that you would not have to wrestle in dying places. But I come by to tell you, it does not matter how many tongues you speak, how many texts you can quote, how, how big your Bible is, how many things you can quote from the spirit of prophecy, how many hymns you sing, how much money you give. Come on, say amen. Amen. Even those who are the sheep of the shepherd will find themselves every now and again in the valley of the shadow of death. Amen. Uh, that's right. Walking Amen. with God can bring you to some valley situations. You've been there. Valleys mm -hmm. are recessed places. Mm -hmm. They are depressed, depressed places. You're in the valley when your spirit isn't just as high as it used to be. Let's be real this morning. We all been there. Yes, I love the Lord. And yes, I'm thankful. But every now and then, my spirit just sinks in me. Life has gotten me so dead, so got me down so bad that I feel like my life is ex exaggerating and, and going away from me. And I don't feel like I feel like I want to feel. And I don't feel Amen. like getting out of the bed in the morning to deal with the day has to bring him back. Amen. Have you ever had a valid situation? Yes, Lord. Not just the valley, but the valley of shadows. <laughs> shadows, beloved, are dark places. They cloud my vision of which way to go. They leave me confused about what I ought to do. 
I really don't know which direction to move in. Have you ever been in a place and at a crossroad and you didn't know what to do? Didn't know what to pray? Didn't know how to begin, didn't know how to how to got yourself in this situation, how you're gonna get yourself out. You are dealing with some shadows. Well, shadows are mm-hmm. cast by other things mm-hmm. nearby. Mm-hmm. You're dealing with shadows whenever you realize that you got a prognosis and a diagnosis of something that is not yet here, but is on the way. Have you ever had a forecast of a problem that was on the way, of some sickness that was coming, of some treatments you had to go through, of a layoff you had to have to be prepared for? Have you ever gone through a valley that caused you to look back and say, what in the world has happened to me? Hmm. Yep. Yeah. You're dealing with shadows, <laughs> the shadows of death. There are many ways to die, emotionally. Well, Relationally, mentally, spiritually, even physically. And you're in the valley of the shadow of death when the things you love and are cherished are withering and dying and there's nothing you can do about it. Come on, Pastor. Come on. When, not if, but when you go through these valley of shadows of death, just remember that verse 4 is meant to give you Three traveling tips for life's low point. This fourth verse is meant to teach you how to manage the valleys of life. First thing it teaches us, Rudy, the first thing it teaches us, watch this. The first thing below with traveling with the tips, traveling tips for low life (laughs) point. The first thing it teaches us is you got to keep it in proper perspective. Yes, sir. Somebody say proper perspective. Proper perspective. Let's do some homework. <laughs> what, Rudy? Next one. Look at how this psalm, watch this. Look at how the psalm, beloved, begins. In verse number four, the psalmist says, Yea. Stop right there. Hmm? The word yea is a Hebrew word for ah. And when it's used as an adverb, watch this, grammatically speaking, the adverb ah, yea, is used to minimize an adjoining phrase to emphasize a more emphatic one. Whew, y'all just missed that. Uh, the word yea on, is meant to minimize what comes right after it, that it might divert your emphasis on a focus hmm. and focus yourself not on what comes after the yay, but what comes way after the yay. And so when David says yay, what he's saying is, I'm minimizing the yay, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, that I might emphasize the I shall fear no evil. Come on, man. Oh, it's not the trouble, but you ought to be more awake than that. Now, I want you to see that I'm keeping it in proper perspective. Yes, sir. I'm Come not on, blowing man. it out of proportion. I'm not tripping. I'm not blowing it up. I'm not saying it's more than it is. I'm saying yay because I realize that the valley is not where my attention should be. Come on, but my attention is on the fact that even in the valley, I shall fear no evil. Thank you, Lord. Thank like you. the way the other versions translates it in the Bible. They say, even though I'm going through the valley. Let me give you the Michael Anthony Edwards version of verse 4. So what? If I'm going through the valley. Come on, say amen. Amen, Pastor. Come on now. So what, beloved? So what if I'm dealing with these things? I know I'm on a low point now, but I'm not tripping about it. I'm not making it a big deal. I'm not looking at it as more than it is. I'm keeping it and proper perspectives. Now, David says, yay. Here's the question, love, I have. How can you put a yay in front of a valley? <laughs> okay, okay. How can you put an even though in front of sickness? Come on, Pastor. How can you put no big deal in front of hard times? How can you put a so what in front of a heartache? Let me teach this psalm. Uh, You will know, beloved, that psalms of David, beloved, 
you'll see here it's called a super strip. Let's go there, Rudy. Next, you yes. watch this. Watch this. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. In the Bible, you'll find a super strip. The super strip is the contextualization of a psalm that precedes verse number one. Go and teach, Pastor Edwards. Come on, Pastor. Oh and that superscript is meant to help us isolate the occurrence that caused the writing of the psalm in the first place. Next one. Example of a few superscript. Here's an example. Watch this. Psalm 51 has a superscript. A psalm of David written yes, sir. when he was confronted by Nathan after he had committed adultery with Bathsheba. Which allows us to know that Psalm 51 is written out of specific context and a particular incident in the life of David. Watch this. Psalm 23 has no contextual superscript. There is no one incident that has been used to write this psalm. Because what David is saying, I'm not just talking about one valley, but I'm talking about and testifying about a journey through many valleys. I've been in low places before. I had to deal with Elhad. I had to deal with Saul. I had to deal with Goliath. I had to deal with the Philistines. I had to deal with Michael. Come on, I had to deal Come with Absalom. I had to deal with Tamara. had to deal with all those who hated me. And so I've been in low places before. And maybe David could say yay because he realized that I've been, even though I've been in many valleys before, that now I realize no valley lasts forever. Amen. Exactly where I've been. Amen, Pastor. I've been low before. I've been down before. I've been messed up before. I've been jacked up before. I've come out of uh, uh, each and every situation. And therefore, I've learned, beloved, that yay, because I found out that no valley lasts forever. Yes, sir. Come on, Pastor. Valley news. All here, those of us here on Zoom Church today, that's some good news, hallelujah. Good news. I, I, I don't Come understand, on, hallelujah, about the fact that trouble don't last forever. I don't know how you feel about that, but I'm glad you know that trouble don't always last forever. I don't know how it is. Amen. I don't care how long you've been there. I don't care how messed up it is. The reality right. is that trouble does not last forever. Amen, Come on, amen. Come on, Pastor. Next time. You're in the valley. I want you to remember the most repeated phrase in the Old Testament. Next one. The most repeated phrase in the Old Testament is this. And it came to pass. Somebody just missed that. Come on, Pastor. Come it on now. It came to stay. It didn't say it came to linger. It didn't say it came to hang out. But it came to pass. And I'm so glad that my valleys don't come to stay, but my valleys are passing over. Beloved, the old saints used to say, trouble don't last always. And I'm so glad that enemies don't last always because they shall soon be cut down like the grass. Come on, I'm glad man. that sickness doesn't last forever because he was wounded for my transgressions, healed for my iniquities, and by his stripes I am healed. I'm glad that hard times don't stay here forever, but God will work all things together for his good to Come those who are born. It came to pass. Thank you, Lord. A little homework. Getting ready for the sermon. This is some homework, brother. Thank you, Lord. And I Thank wanted to see what the Bible said would come to stay. Mm -hmm. Watch this. What does the Bible talk about remaining and never changing? Mm -hmm. Watch this. I looked at it, beloved, and I found out that some things the Lord does will stay forever. <laughs> Y'all missed that. Come on, There's Pat. a lot of things come the Bible on, say about trouble, but trouble is one of the things that stay. Come on, say amen. Amen, Pastor. His mercy endures forever. His truth is from everlasting to everlasting. His truth and his word is a buckler for those who come to him. His sovereignty is for everlasting to everlasting. His name changes not. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. I'm so glad that the goodness of God does not change. Touch somebody next to you and tell them it came to pass. You know what David said, beloved? Hmm. My dad's talked to me about things 
and I'm reading about David, and my dad said to me, he said, Michael, he said, he said, son, don't jump out the window every time something bad happens. Mm -hmm. He used to say, uh, don't throw in the towel. Uh, don't lay down and die just because life has dealt you a bad hand. Mm -hmm. You got to learn to keep it in perspective. Mm -hmm. And I came by today to play tour guide for somebody memory lane. And remind you that this is not the first time you've been down. This is not well, the first time you had to trust in God. This is not the first time that you had to talk with God. This is not the first time you somebody talked about you. This is not the first time somebody lied on you. This is not the first time your money was running out. This is not the first time you've been sticking in your body. This is not the first time the bottom has dropped out of your life. This is not the first time you didn't know which way to go. And if God yes, brought well, you through those yes. valleys in the past, I'm just convinced that God is able Amen. to bring it through you, even now, in your presence. Thank you, Lord. Okay, okay. Um, uh, I, I, I'm going to try to explain. I'm seeing y'all not feeling like I want you to feel me. Um, watch, watch this. Uh, beloved, I, I, like, I don't like watching a lot of TV. And, and I was raised, you know, at a certain time when certain things came on TV. But today, most of the stuff on TV is vulgar. Come yes, on, say sir. amen. Yes, sir. Amen, Pastor. Come on now. Bad language. Amen. Sexual connotation. Come on, say amen. Yes, sir. Come on, Pastor. And, and so, uh, amen. I, I, I amen. don't watch too much of that joke, man. I don't watch it. I don't watch it. I'm a fan, however, of the sitcoms. I was raised out in the 70s. You know those black sitcoms? <laughs> Come on, I'm Pastor. a fan of That's My Mom. Mm. I, I like what's happening. Yes, sir. I can get down with good times. <laughs> my favorite sitcom, Rudy. My favorite show of all times is <laughs> Sanford and Son. Nuns. Oh, come on. I like man. these some S or some Fred yes. G. S A N F O R D period. I like these some Fred Sanford. And come you know what? You can't catch San Sanford and Son on any channel. Hmm? There's only one cable station that still shows it. It's called TV, TV Land. In. And if you don't know about TV Land, TV Land never has new shows on it. TV Lands are dedicated to showing nothing to you but reruns. And you. turn on TV Land, and when you turn on, you're likely to see something you already saw before. Yes. Sir. A while ago, some years back, on Thanksgiving Day, they had a Thanksgiving Day marathon <laughs> of Stanford and Son. I sat man on that TV during the half day long, all day long, watching <laughs> my favorite Fred G. S O R S A N O R D. Shepherd, come on, say amen. Come on, Pastor. I like watching old Fred calling him my Amen. I like laughing at him calling Esther uh, a gorilla. I like hearing him call <laughs> Woodrow a drunk. I like old Shane and Granny, good gobbledy goo. I love Sanford and Son. And after watching a couple episodes with me, my son, my older son, wanted to change the channel. Oh, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I looked at him with one of those looks saying, don't you touch that remote look. Mm. And he said, Daddy, this doesn't make any sense. Mm. He said, you've been watching these before. You've seen them before. You're quoting the lines. Come on, How come man. you always like to watch reruns? Come on. And I said to him, I said, son, I just like watching reruns. I like seeing Fred do what I've seen him already do. Yes. I like it when, when I know the outcome. I like it when I can say, been there, done that, and I know what's going to happen. And I come by to tell somebody, in your valley experiences, that this ain't nothing but a rerun. You've been there. You've done that. God did it for you. Come on, Don't Pastor. Just, just sit back and Amen. enjoy the show. Well. Lord have mercy. Turn to somebody and say, this is just a rerun. Just a rerun. Thank you. You got to keep it. In proper perspective. So when you're going through the valley, number two, really number two, make certain. Thank you. Make certain, love, that you make some perpetual progress. Let me say it again. Make certain you're in the valley. It's not working for your peers. Make sure you make certain that you make some per perpetual progress. Look what the psalmist says. He says, yea, though I walk. Mm -hmm. Beloved, this bothers me a little bit. 
because it's instinctive to me. When I'm in the valley of life, my only objective is to get through it, over it, and out of it mm -hmm. as fast as I humanly can. Yes, sir. Come on, Pastor. So would it be more, <laughs> make more sense for the psalmist to say, yea, though I run through the valley? No, walk. Hustle through Come the on. valley. Try to get out of the valley as quickly as possible. What I found out, and you know I'm right, in the valley sometimes leaves you unable to run. That's right. Sometimes in these low places, you don't have the energy to do what you used to do. That's right. When your spirit is low, you don't operate how you used to operate. Not as effective as you used to be. Not as efficient as you want to be. Can't get done the things you want to get done. And the temptation of the valley is to get you so depressed about what you can't do that you don't do what you could do. Okay. Paul, stop me one. Read that again, Pastor. Sometimes in the valley, you get so depressed mm -hmm. about what you can do that you don't do what you could do. Come on, Pastor. You don't do what you could to help yourself get out of the valley that you're in. So upset. I can't get out like I used to. Can't run like I used to. Can't operate like I want to. Well, it got me down so bad that I don't have the energy. I don't have the joy. I don't have the gusto. I don't have the zeal. I can't operate like I want to operate. And the temptation is to simply to lay down and stay in the valley. But David says that even if I can't run out of this thing, I'm not going to lay down in it. I'm not going to set up camp in it. I'm not going to get used to it. But I'm going to well, walk my way. One step at a time, one day at a time, I'm going to yes. do what I need to do to get, uh -huh. com get comfortable and get out of that valley. Well, there was, next one, Rudy, there was an actor by the name of Charles S. Duckman. Thank you, Lord. Starred in. Thank you, Lord. Rudy, next one. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Next one, Rudy. There was an actor by the name of Charles S. Dutton. And he had a sitcom a while ago called Rock. He also starred in a couple of the Resurrection movies. And Charles Dutton, if you read his biography, was a brother who was incarcerated for 15 years. Baltimore. But yes. suddenly released, he wound up at Yale drama school. Come on now, Pastor. Come on. They asked him how he was able to stay out of prison. Mm -hmm. Realized how many young black men have this specific tendency to go back into jail. Listen to what he said. He said, I was in jail for 15 years. But while I was there, I refused to decorate my cell. I didn't put pictures up. I didn't decorate it. I didn't try to make it fancy. I didn't get comfortable in there because I realized this is not where I want to stay. This is not where I'm trying to live. This is not where I'm going to lay down and die. But every day I'm getting up trying to get myself out of this thing. Come on, say amen. You got to make some progress, beloved. Don't get right. comfortable in the valley. Don't decorate amen. the valley. Don't set up camp in the valley. But keep uh -huh. on walking. The psalmist says, you got to do something while you're in the valley. Help us, Lord. Help us, if Lord. You can't run, walk. If you can't take big steps, take little steps. Come on, Pastor. If you can't do what you used to do, do what you can. Come on, Pastor. If you can't get a ride, yes. if you can't drive, then get a ride. Come on, say amen. Amen. Come on now, Pastor. If you can't buy a house, clean your raggedy apartment. Well, <laughs> if you can't shop at Marshall, go <laughs> with Marshalls. If you can't pay 15%, pay 10%. Well, if you can't stand well, up, if you can't stand up and shout, at least wave your hand. But at least do something. Don't sit there and die. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Mm -hmm. Come on, Pastor. Look at that person next to you and tell them 
you got to make some progress. Thank you, Lord. Perpetual progress. Here's the third one. Beloved, when you're in the valley, you got to know that the valley has preparative purpose. That the valley is preparing you and preparing for something greater. Beloved, I can, I, I, I want to get deep this now. This, this is so important. It's so important. If you don't get this, man, ugh. so I want you to turn to him and say, listen, listen, try to get this, y'all. Get this. Watch this. Here it is. Here it is. Here it is. Oh. Verse 4 is preceded by verse 3. And followed by verse 5. I just want to make sure you get that. Let me say it again. <laughs> verse 4 is preceded by verse 3 and preceded by verse 5. Why is that important? Because in verse 3, the psalmist declares, I'm being led by the shepherd. Watch this, but it's important. I'm being led by the shepherd down the path of righteousness. But yet, here I am in the valley. Stay with me now. Could it be? Could it be? The valleys for the sheep sometimes come by the direction and the discretion of the shepherd. And just because I'm in the valley doesn't mean I'm no longer on the path of righteousness. Come on, say amen. Come on, Pastor. Y'all got to see it. It's in the psalm that I, I, I'm here because a shepherd has led me here. And I was on a path of being what the shepherd wanted me to be. So I'm in a valley. And in my valley, I got some good news. The only reason I'm here is because the shepherd brought me here to prepare oh, me for something oh, that works for his glory and my good. Amen. I'm not here because of the accident. I'm not here because I brought it upon myself. I'm not here because uh, some God is punishing me. But I'm here because he's got something better. All right now. Thank you, Lord. That he's taking me to. Verse 3. God. Verse 5, however, shares with us where the psalmist is going. You got to catch this, man. Here we go. Watch where the psalmist is going. The psalmist says in verse 4, I'm going through the valley. Now, I have a problem right now. We'd have a big problem if he was going to the valley. Because if the text says he was going to the valley, that would be the end of the psalms. But he says, I'm going through the valley. Because after verse 4 comes verse 5, I'm going through the valley. So I can get to the table on, that's pass. prepared for me. Oh, y'all missed that. Y'all missed right. that. I wish I had some, some real evidence out there who realize that when I'm Amen. going to the house, God is preparing me for what's prepared for me. All right now. Amen. God is still preparing me for what's prepared for me. That my valley is getting me ready for something greater that God has set aside with my name on it. And even if it has been delayed, I've been not denied of what God has in store for me. Come on, Pastor. Come on, Pastor. Yeah. Right there, man. I feel it right there. And it is amazing how the Lord can use a valley to set your table. I feel like preaching right there, man. It was the valley depression and incarceration that got Joseph ready for this table in Egypt. It was the valley of the Red Sea that got the children of Israel ready for the table of the oh, promised Pastor. land. It was the valley of tending sheep for his daddy that got David ready for the table of being king of Israel. God is able to use a valley to set your table. Somebody, I need you to preach this message with me today because you can look back over your valley and know that your valley just got you ready. For a table that God has prepared for you. Is there anybody here today who's grateful for your valley? If you thank God for your valley, raise your hand. Valleys, beloved, has taught me to praise God. Valleys have taught you to praise God. Your valley taught you to trust God. Your valley taught you to weep and you'll always last forever. Your valley taught you to wait on God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I thank God. Yes, Lord. For the valley. Yes. He's brought me through. Yes. And if that's you right now, I know you're sitting down comfortable in your house, chilling. But if you are thankful for the valleys and understand what God is doing. Yes. Yes. In our lives, Remnant Church, what God is doing for us in our lives. If you realize that and understand it, would you stay where you are? 
Stand where you are by faith. Thank you. Come on, Lord. stand with me. Father, you're preparing Thank us. You, we don't like it. It's not comfortable. It don't feel good. Preparing your people, you're preparing us for something greater. Thank you, God. For something greater. Let's not lose sight of the fact that even in our valley experiences, if we let them, they will draw us closer to God. And whenever God decides to do what God's going to do, as he does it, you make sure, and I'll make sure that we're still in his hands, that we're still on the Lord's side. What are these valleys doing? God knows what he's doing. As Job. <laughs> God knows what he's doing. So we thank you, Lord, for the valleys that remind us to call on you, to remind us to trust in you, to remind us to wait on you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Everybody say amen. 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 Say praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Amen. Amen. <laughs>